Luke 16, let's stand together this morning. Luke chapter 16, I'm not going to read the entire uh, story here. I'm going to presume a little bit upon your knowledge. Uh, I'm going to read down through verse number 26. After that, he prays for his brethren, the rich man that died. He wanted, Mo wanted Abraham to send uh, Moses from the dead uh, to go and preach the gospel to his five brothers who were lost. And, and uh, that's certainly a part of the story. I'll refer to it. Uh, but we're not going to read that for sake of time. And the emphasis is a little different this morning from this story. Luke chapter 16, verse number 19. There was a certain rich man which, which, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, and being in, tor being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Heavenly Father, we do ask for your blessing on your word. And Father, as we did here in the Sunday School Hour, we pray for the light and the perfection, the light of Christ, and Lord, the guidance of the Holy Spirit through your words. You said that the entrance of your words gives light. And so, Father, we pray that your words be a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. If there's one, Lord, that is listening, that is watching, that is here this morning, that is not saved, that they would come to know Christ as their Savior, Lord, for a certainty before it's eternally too late. Father, for those of us that are saved, Lord, may we be reminded of the richness and the treasures of the Gospels, and Lord, more effective in our Gospel efforts for you. We ask your blessing now, and your power, and your spirit, and his fullness. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church. You can be seated. Let me just say this by way of introduction, something I've said before, and I've, uh, again, I've preached from this passage uh, more than once through the years, uh, but going to approach it just a little bit differently this morning. But at the outset, let me just to, to help you, because sometimes uh, you never know who's hearing it for the first time, and people, there's a little bit of confusion. When Jesus told this story, at that time, the Bible teaches us that hell is in the center of the earth. Our earth's core is a, is a molten burning core. And, that is, and before Jesus died on the cross, look, when Adam sinned, he had separated himself from fellowship with God, and God, man could not be brought into fellowship with God until the blood of Jesus Christ was placed on the mercy seat on the altar of heaven. And so people that died before Calvary, God had to have a place for them until the blood of Jesus allowed them, that the blood of Jesus was what opened the door of heaven. He said, I am the door. But that door did not open into the third heavens, the presence of God, until the blood of Jesus was put on the mercy seat. So, in the, before Jesus died on the cross in the heart of the earth, hell is still there today. That is different than the lake of fire. One day, death and hell will be cast into the lake of fire at the end of the millennial reign of Christ, the great white throne judgment. At the very end, God's going to make a new heavens and a new earth, and there will be a, a, a lake of fire that is produced for all those who have spent up to that point their, their, uh, their eternity in hell up to that point. Then death and hell and all will be cast into the lake of fire. So those are two new, a future heaven and a future hell. But there is a present heaven and a present hell. Now paradise was uh, before in the Old Testament when people died, they went to paradise. We call it Abraham's bosom. And it was in the heart of the earth. You know, you're, uh, some of you maybe have read the old book, Journey to the Center of the Earth, and they found beneath the earth all this, this stuff. Well, uh, I don't know if the author was influenced by the Bible, but it's possible. But at, at some point, there was a place. It's not there now, but before Christ died, there was paradise, and there was a gulf between heaven or, or between paradise and hell. And when Jesus came and he rose from the dead, the Bible tells us in Matthew 27, the graves of the saints were opened, and they came out, and he led captivity captive. And I understand, I'm giving you a lot of theology in about three minutes, okay? Uh, I, I've given it to you in messages before. I'm just reminding you so that there's not a, 
uh, uh, an area of confusion this morning. Uh, and Jesus took all those Old Testament saints into the presence of God in heaven. When you and I die as New Testament believers, we don't go to paradise. We go straight to heaven. Why? Because of the blood. Jesus is the door. He is the hinge of history. The blood was not there when Jesus told this story. And it's a true story. This is not a parable. This does not say that he spake a parable unto them again, saying, it says, a certain rich man, his name withheld, probably out of courtesy uh, to the... Uh, to the family that was living and compassion for the rich man himself. Uh, history calls him dives. Dives is just the Latin word for money. That's all riches. That's what, what it means. So that's the name that, that history has given him. But, it, but Lazarus is named. And this is not the Lazarus that Jesus brought back from the dead. Uh, again, and, and I could go into a lot of time, but I'm not going to do that. I need to get to the message this morning. Uh, but this, there, Lazarus was a common name. This was a different individual, okay? Now, we know that uh, we always give our attention uh, to the conversation, to the details of hell, the torments of hell, and, and I have done that, and we should do that, but there's also something else here. Uh, they should, we, we need to give them, but there are other things that we don't want to pass by uh, about what we know about the men. I can't think of another story in the Bible that gives us a clearer depiction of the only two fates of all mankind. There is everlasting life and there is everlasting death. There is no limbo, there is no purgatory. Those are man-made doctrines. You won't find either word anywhere in your Bible. Okay? There is, uh, there is a bright heaven, there is a burning hell. And these two men, it's a true story about two real men that represent the whole of humanity in view of eternity. And questions even from the book of Job are answered here. Job chapter 14, it says this in verse 10, But a man, but man dieth and wasteth away, yea, yea, man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? The Bible tells us where we go when we die. If a man dies, shall he live again? Job said, yes. The Bible tells us if you have everlasting life, you will. But if you have everlasting death, you die forever. And there is a vast difference, not just between heaven and hell, but between the two men. The one was rich, the other a beggar. Uh, one went to heaven, one went to hell, one was tormented, and one was comforted. But there are differences between the two, but there is also something, there, are, there is a way in which they are not that different. All right? Now, there is, there is more different between them, all right, than there is in common, but everybody has certain things in common. Everybody's going to die. If Jesus tarries his coming, everybody's going to die, okay? Everybody's going to spend eternity somewhere. Uh, everybody's got a life, and you're going to make a decision what you do with your life, and if you're going to give your heart to Christ or if you're going to re uh, refuse uh, to trust Christ as your Savior. They, all made, they both made a choice, about their eternity, okay? Uh, but I, I want to just give you three things this morning. Two things that they were, they were different on and one thing that they had in common, okay? And the one in common is in the, is in the middle. But I, I just want to give you three things and just, just share this story with you with a little bit different emphasis that maybe we don't always consider, all right? Uh, that might be a help to somebody today. And number one is this. I want you to notice the difference in their money. And I understand that that is the thing that we always point out. Well, the rich man was rich and Lazarus uh, was poor. And, uh, uh, and so in our mind, now listen, I know we know better than this, but this is what people tend to think, okay? The rich man enjoyed the things of his life, so he deserved nothing in eternity. The beggar had nothing in life, so he should be re rewarded in death. That's not true. Okay? Our nature tends to lean towards the idea that the beggar went to heaven because he was poor, and the rich man went to hell because he was rich. And that's not true. We know better than this, but we still tend to picture this in our mind. It is due in part because Lazarus suffered suffered evil, and the rich man lived sumptuously, so we think that everybody at some point ought to get it good. That's not true. There is certainly a point our Lord is making here about ignoring uh, th this life for earthly riches uh, and the things of today, but the rich man did not die and go to hell because he was rich. I understand a lot of people, they don't want anything to do with God. The more you have, the more you don't need God. But that's, that's not why people die and go to hell. Money is amoral. It is not good. 
It is not evil. It can be used for good. You give it to missions, it's used for good. It can be used for evil. You go, uh, you go blow it on booze in the boat, you've used it for evil. The money's not the issue. It's who's doing what with it. It has no moral compass. It has no power except the power of the person that uses it. Money had nothing to do with the eternal destination of either man. He had a large amount of, of material goods. But listen, it doesn't say that he stole to get them. It doesn't say that he cheated or took advantage of others to get them. Do you understand? This, this very possibly could have been simply a hard working man who had reaped the harvest of honest labors. I can name you selfie, several wealthy believers in the Bible. Every one of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph and his brethren, all wealthy, King David, Solomon, Queen Esther, Nicodemus, Mary, uh, the mother of John Mark, the sister of Barnabas. Barnabas was wealthy. Luke, uh, the physician. Paul was wealthy before he was saved. Lydia, the seller of purple. Philemon. I could go on and on and on. The Bible lists many wealthy people that went to heaven. What about Christian men like J.C. Penney and J.R. Remington and Thomas Welsh and John D. Rockefeller, the very first Rockefeller. Somebody once asked John G. D. Rockefeller uh, the secret to his financial success. And he says, my mother taught me that the first dime of every dollar be gone, belonged to God. I've always put God first and, and, uh, and God has honored me. And I believe that John D. Rockefeller, by the time he died, was giving 90% of his income to the work of the gospel in some way and living on 10%. His 10% is more than our 100, okay? Even, that, even in today's money. R.G. Letourneau with the Caterpillar Corporation. Did you know R.G. Letourneau had a heart for pastors and missionaries who retired and they lived in parsonages and they didn't have in his day social security or any kind of income and he literally built entire communities in the state of Georgia uh, and, and independently supported um, pastors and missionaries in their old age that had no support and, and uh, founded a Bible college and other things like that. Uh, John Wanamaker Henry Hines from Hines Ketchup and Henry Hilton of Hilton Hotels and James Craft and Henry Crowell of uh, Quaker Oats. I could name you scores. By the way, many of those people, J.C. Penney, another one, that gave over 80%, most of them, 90 to 95% of their income that they gave in some way to the work of the gospel. Okay, And there are Christian, professing Christian believers and businessmen like that today. Let me just put it down where you and I live. I'd like to say this morning, I'm just here to tell you, the vast majority of the people in this auditorium this morning, you have more wealth and more material goods than more than two-thirds of the world's population. If you make $40,000 a year, and I understand there might be some in here that don't, but most do, and there are many that make well over twice that, and even beyond that, and that, that that's... That, that's, no, uh, that's just a, a, a fact of the matter. That if you make $40,000 a year, you make twice the global median income. And we don't think $40 a year is a lot of money these days. Okay? Now, if you make $40,000 a year and you have no children at home, do you understand that you are in the top 2.6% of the world's wealthiest people. See, you got your eye on Bill Gates and you know Warren Buffett and all these other people. And I understand they have uh, th th those people are so few and so ex and so rare. Most people in this room, most people in this auditorium, we are still in the 2.6% of the world. Now, we don't think that we are. You know why? Because somebody has a nicer house than we do. Because there's something that we still don't have money to buy. Let me tell you something. I don't care how much money you have. There's always something money can't buy. I don't care if, if you own trillions of dollars. It can't buy your soul. It can't buy your ride on the rocket ship to the moon, whatever this guy's trying to do, you know. There's things money will buy. There are things that money will never buy no matter. There's always something you want that's out of reach. You might not think that you're rich because you compare yourself to those who have more because you do not have everything you wished you had, but by the world's standard, you and I probably are better off than the rich man in the book of Luke. 
Most of us have more than we can sell or give away. Most of us throw away things that some people will never have and would treasure. By the way, let me just ask you this question this morning. Is your salvation in jeopardy because of your prosperity and your possessions? Then we ought to all give, sell everything away, move out into the street and start begging. Is that what determines your eternity? It's not what determines your eternity. He lived sumptuously. Yeah, but he was clothed in purple and fine linen. There are people in this room. When's the last time you've seen somebody in a suit at Walmart? Okay, when's the last time you've seen somebody that was not in their pajamas at Walmart? Okay. <laughs> I have a friend in Alaska, and he said, he, every now and then he'll tell me, he said, this is really cold today. People are wearing two sets of pajamas at Walmart <laughs> in Alaska. And uh, Pastor Gray says that. And look, by the way, I, I, I'm not going to apologize. I, I think we ought to dress our best and honor the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords Amen. with our very best and strive to do our best. But you know, we, we have better food at our pitch-in dinners. We have everything as sumptuously as the rich man had, maybe things he never had. I don't think that he had that. I, I don't think that he had the apple pies that we get. I don't think he got the persimmon pudding that we have. I don't think that he got the Oreo souffle and the cherry cheesecake, and they had stuff that may have been good to them, but I don't think he could touch what we got and we take it home because we can't eat it all. Is our salvation in jeopardy? Do we, do we deserve hell because we have money? I'm certain that many beggars, uh, look, uh, I, I, he was clothed in purple and fine linen. Uh, I know people in this room that have expensive clothes and shoes and purses and, and guns and whatever else you want. And I'm certain that many beggars have died and gone to hell. I've seen people, people begging on the streets of almost every country I've been to. By the way, I've been surprised some of the places that I've been. I remember being with Jenny and I a few years ago on the streets of Paris. And I couldn't believe the number of people on the streets begging. And then I thought about other places in the United States where I've seen people on the streets begging. Then I thought about Walmart up in Terre Haute. Is there ever a day there's not somebody else? You know, they used to say, put up a sign and say, we'll work for food. They don't do that no more. You might ask them. Now they just say this. What do they say? Hard times, God bless. Or they'll say this. I'm a veteran. Okay? Playing on our... Look, it's hard for everybody. It's just harder if you're stupid and lazy. Okay? I, I worked for a year and a half in an inner city rescue mission. And... We had a place where people could come to and they could have, uh, they could have a, warm, a warm bed to sleep on, three hot meals a day. Now, we didn't give anybody a free lunch. They had to be willing to push them up. Or they had to be willing to run a dust rag or, or something like that. Very, very minimal. And I knew people that would sleep on the streets in the wintertime because they'd rather have their poverty than work for something good. I also saw uh, just three blocks south of our rescue mission, there's a railroad trestle that went over uh, Keystone Avenue there, Rural Street, and uh, we used to go up and down, and, and there was kind of a tent city out there, people living in cardboard boxes, living in tents, that, and, and could have had a, had a place to go three blocks away, and they would spend year-round. They wouldn't, they wouldn't take anything if you give it to them. They wouldn't take a hot meal. They wouldn't take warm clothing. We tried to help. We would go there to try and reach out and help those people, and they would take nothing from us. I've seen men with master's degrees and PhDs living on the streets. Why? Well, there are people that were beggars because they were lazy and slothful. Some were more hooked on booze and drugs, and they'd rather spend a night in the cold and forfeit their families, or they were gamblers or drug addicts, and and. Let me ask you something. Should the sluggard, the drunkard, or the gambler, or the drug addicts, or the junkies be allowed into heaven because they're poor? And you and I be denied because we have something? Do you understand? You could be clothed in rags and covered in sores and still be on your way to hell. And some poverty is self-inflicted. A.W. Tozer used to say you could be as poor as a church mouse and still be as bad as a church rat. The difference in their money had nothing to do with where they spent eternity. 
I don't think, let me ask you, are any of us any different than the rich man? Should we be denied heaven based on the wages we receive for our work? Should we give everything away and beg to earn our place in heaven? If that were true, you could tell how close a man was to heaven by the size of his bank account or the lack of what's in it. Let me say this, money wasn't the only thing different between them. The second thing that was different uh, was in morality. And by this, I'm just going to, I'm not sure this was the case of the rich man, but I'm going to tell you this is the case of rich men many times. I don't know if it was this rich man's case, but it is the case often of rich men. Sometimes there's absolutely no difference in the morals of the rich man and the beggar. We believe that Lazarus was moral because he was saved, and I believe that, he, I believe that Lazarus was a moral man. I don't believe Jesus would have probably used somebody that had a poor testimony to make such a, a striking illustration. I believe that Lazarus would have had what we would call and refer to as a good Christian testimony, that he's a good person. But we think that the rich man must be immoral or he would not be rich. And I don't, I, I don't know that there was any difference in their morality. Again, I believe Lazarus was a good and moral man, but I don't think that the rich man was immoral just because he was rich. Now listen, stay with me all the way to the end, okay? We tend to believe that the rich man was a bad man, again, because he was rich, and the beggar uh, was a good man uh, because he was poor, but I'd like to point out that Jesus doesn't have anything to b bad to say about the rich man. He tells us the state of his life and the condition of his life. He does not say a negative word about the man himself, okay? Abraham observed how he lived his life, but it doesn't say that he was a bad man. The rich man could have been known as a good person. He might have lived his life trying to be a good person. Do you have to be poor to be a good person? By the way, I've known poor people that had poor character. I've met rich people with rich character. And I've met rich people with poor character and people that were poor that had rich character. Now, you figure all that out later, all right? But if you understand what I'm saying. It says that Lazarus received evil things in his life. It doesn't say that the evil came from the hand of the rich man. Hard times had fallen upon Lazarus, and Lazarus laid at the rich man's gate, desiring the crumbs to be fed. Let me ask you something. Could the rich man have run Lazarus off if he was bothered by some beggar living outside of his house on the street? You betcha. Would the local magistrate want to keep himself in the favor and the graces of a man like this, a man of means, an influence, who could do something more for the community? Perhaps the magistrate came and said, I'm not saying this is true, but again, I'm not saying this is true of this rich man, but I will say it is true of rich men, some. The magistrate might have come to the rich man and said, hey, do you want me to get this guy off, away from you? He's like, no, just, just leave him alone. He's had it pretty tough. He desired the crumbs and all oh, we want to get down on the rich man. How did the crumbs get outside the gate? Somebody had to take them. Now, I'm not saying the rich man did. And why would Lazarus stay here? Why was this the place that Lazarus chose to set up shop? Because he had found a place, perhaps with a little grace, a little mercy, and a little compassion. Perhaps the, la the rich man was the one that was sending the servants with the leftovers, but uh, that doing something for him. Could he have done more? Oh, who could? By the way, could you be doing more than you are right now? Come on, I'm not going to die. If I died in this moment and stood before God, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to do the best I can. But do you remember that old song that says that when we stand before, somehow I wish I had done more. But he was doing something. The only reason that, the, the, you know what? The beggar did not die of starvation. He was going to die at some point. Perhaps he lived longer because of the compassion. Of the rich. Do, you, do you know how many wealthy men, uh, met, there were men uh, like John D. Rockefeller, there were also some that were not Christian men. I, I can see the man's face. I wish I could um, 
pull his name out, and I can't. But he came to America in poverty. If I said his name, I believe it was Andrew Carnegie. As far as I know, Andrew Carnegie was not a Christian man. He may have been, but there was Rockefeller Carnegie, and there were two other men. There were four men. So uh, two of them were saved, and two of them were not. I can't remember exactly who. But you know, even I've known lost men, and, and it was true of those four men. And some refer to them as titans and men that built America. But they... They, lived, they, spent the, they spent all their life building their wealth, and then at the end of their days, they spent their lives, the remaining days, giving it away. And some of them were saved, and some of them were not saved. They were just good moral men. And they cared about humanity, and they cared about their country, and they had compassion. Why did, La, why did he ask for Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool his tongue? If he'd have left if he, had been out, if he had been hard on Lazarus, if he had kicked Lazarus outside the gate and run him off and not care for Lazarus would have been the last person he'd asked for a drip of water. He'd just asked Abraham. Perhaps he asked Lazarus because he was perhaps imploring on the fact that maybe Lazarus would remember his kindness and his, command, his compassion in sharing his crumbs and maybe Lazarus would in turn send a drop of water. Is it at least a possibility that we have not considered? Would not Lazarus be probably more than willing to offer him that drink of gratitude? We're not told, we're not told of what Lazarus sitting by had to say, only what Abraham, perhaps, perhaps Lazarus is pulling up the hem of Abraham's garments. Please let me. Maybe this sheds a little light on what it says here. I want you to look down here. In verse 26, beside all this between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. They which would pass from paradise to you, rich man, who would that be? Is it possible that Lazarus would have done his best to give that man a drop of water? Especially even based on the fact that he was a Christian. Even though the rich man was in eternal torments, he was still concerned for his brethren. Would you send Lazarus back from the dead then? If I can't have the water, fine. But this is, this is not a, a selfish man that's crying out in hell. Once, his torment, once he's, he's been condemned to his torments, fine, but I have five brothers. Send Lazarus from the dead. No, they got Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. I'll address that in a moment. But selfish people think only of themselves. Let me tell you something. You've never been burning in hell. And I pray to God you never do. But most people burning in hell would be crying out, get me out of here. Oh God, save me now. Oh God, I'm sorry. You listen to me. The tears of repentance in hell are very real and very sincere, but they're just too late. And this man's concerned for his brethren. Maybe the one thing they had in common was that they were both, quote unquote, humanly speaking, good men. You know, one of the things I tell people, you could be the best person on earth, but you're going to stand before God in heaven. And at that point, we all fall short. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all miss that mark. No one meets that standard. Here's the last thing, church. Here's the big difference. This is the point I'm trying to make. I hope you get this. We think the rich man was a bad man because he was rich, and he was bad because he was rich, and Lazarus was a good man because he was poor, and so because he was poor, he had to be good. That's not the case. Do you understand? Lazarus could have been a beggar. Perhaps he had lost everything by ill-gotten gains. I'm not saying he did. And maybe then, he, maybe then it was that he came to, to, to trust Christ when he lost everything he had. That, there's certainly that tale has been told a thousand times over in the history of the church. I'm just saying I don't know that there was that much difference between their morals. This was the difference, their Messiah. 
The difference between these two men is what they did with the Son of Man, the man Christ Jesus. The difference between these men, each man had made a clear choice regarding the fate of their eternity. And the rich man obviously knew who Moses and the prophets were. That meant he was, no one's going to stand before God and say, well, I didn't know. No, God promises that he will reveal himself through creation and through conscience to every man. If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. The book of Psalms, Romans chapter 1, tells us that, that, that creation, no one's going to look out at creation and say there is no God. An atheist makes a conscious act uh, decision in their own will, in their own heart and in their own mind. God, God's going to, and Christ has been lifted up. He is drawing all men, always has, always will. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that man knew who Moses and the prophets were. So he, had, he had a knowledge that there was a God in heaven. There's something, there's a void in every person that only God can fill. You can't fill it with money. That man had enough money to know it, that only, that something eternal, Created in the image and likeness of God. Created for fellowship with God. Created to know God. And that man knew that. And that's what separated them between heaven and hell. The Mosaic law revealed the sinfulness of man. Something we don't want to hear anymore. We don't want anybody talking to us about our sin. Uh, saved people don't want anybody talking about their sin anymore. We're okay if we're getting on the sins of the unbelievers. But don't touch the sin of the saint. Just leave us alone and you know what, sadly, there are churches that are being bought off where if we give enough money, we'll keep the preacher quiet. Okay? By the way, it ain't this church. Never has been, never will be. Okay? And, we, and he didn't want to read the law of Moses because it revealed his sinfulness. Revealed how bad he was. And he didn't want to... Take heed to the prophets that give all the prophecies, 330 prophecies about the Messiah, about the coming Christ, about the one with The rich man had the 23rd Psalm. He had uh, of the great shepherd uh, giving uh, his life, uh, the Psalm 22, the good shepherd giving his life for the sheep, and Psalm 23, the, the, the risen shepherd, and Psalm 24, the the, the coming king of glory, the coming shepherd. He had the prophecies of Isaiah. He had the prophecies of Zechariah. He had everything, and so he had everything he needed. He knew, he knew where the Romans' world was of his day to send to his brethren. The difference was Lazarus put his faith in the promise of, of the Messiah, the anointed Jesus Christ to come, and he died and went to heaven. And the rich man refused to believe and died in his sins, probably too busy probably too busy in the business, his business affairs. Perhaps he thought he would have time later, wait till he was older. Death came sooner than he thought. Death always comes sooner than we think. Perhaps he didn't have time for religion. He'd leave his fate in the hands of God, trusting that his good works would outweigh his bad works. Well, there are so many people out there that say there's so many different ways to get to heaven. You don't know who to believe. So I'm just going to be a good person, leaving in the hands of God. And when I die, uh, God knows that I'm a good person. And God knows my heart. Yes, he does. And he knows that your heart is exactly what he said it is. It's desperately wicked, deceitful above all things. And you're not willing to admit it. And God's not going to leave you. You've made a choice in leaving yourself to fate and instead of accepting the perfect and acceptable will of God, the goodness of God which leadeth thee to repentance. And you're not just going to throw your hands up in the air. Here's the thing. Y'all have children and you can tell when they're lying and when they're telling the truth. You got a little kid. Did you take a cookie out of the cookie jar? No, but their mouth is covered in cookie crumbs. And they got Oreo crumbs and cream all over their fingers. Look, you can listen to some snake oil salesman and know that what he's saying don't make any more sense than a flea on a tricycle making laps around a Cheerio, as they say. It don't make no sense. And Jesus said this, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. There's something about hearing the truth. It comes with conviction. It comes with the Spirit of God. It, 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 we know it. I'm going to tell you the rich man went to hell because he deserved to be there. He may have been a good and honest and hardworking man. We have no reason to believe otherwise, although it may have been the case. He, he may have been an honest man, a moral man, but he was still a sinner, and as good as he might have been, he fell short of the glory of God, and all his righteousness were as filthy rags, and his riches could do nothing for him. And obviously, he might have been the best man in town. He may have been a great philanthropist. He may have been very generous. 
He may have been very giving. They might, when he died, they might have named a street after him or a park or a school, even a town. But all the corruption of sin that had been festering within him had come due, and no matter how much he had, the wages of sin is death. And he couldn't pay, make the payment that came due. And outwardly, he might have been a whited sepulcher. Everybody on the outside thought this is the best man. We'll see. He might have been the one that they got to the funeral and said, I know he's in heaven. I know he is a good man. He is a good person. If anybody's going to go to heaven, it's going to be him. John Newton said that the three wonders of heaven, he said, he said the first wonder in heaven will be to see people that I did not think would be there. What a wonder. There'll be people that, like Lazarus, that we didn't, we didn't think they were going, and then they're there. He said, the second great wonder will be to find that there are people not there that I expected to see. He is a good man. He said, the third and the greatest wonder of all shall be to find myself there. Amen. The beggar didn't deserve heaven either. Do you know what the name Lazarus means? The name Lazarus is the New Testament form of the Old Testament name Eliezer. The Lord is my help. He could say with the psalmist in Psalm chapter 33, verse 20, Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and shield. Psalm 38, verse 22, Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. Psalm chapter 70, verse 5, But I am poor and needy. Make haste unto me, O God. Thou art my help and my deliverer. O Lord, make no tarry. Lazarus was poor on earth, but he was rich in faith. Lazarus went to heaven because he was wise enough to say, I know I need help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He was just as rotten as the rich man. His sins were just as filthy as his rags and his sores. His, sin, his sins didn't deserve the comfort of the dogs that licked his sores. Perhaps his sin had brought him to poverty. If it did, then it was the best thing to happen to him because it brought him to the bottom where he had no place to look but up. And he could be a little humble. You know what? When I preach in the jail, I tell those guys in there and I say, I, I say this to every new group of guys I meet. I said, I don't know what brought you here. If, you, if you're here, life's not going well. But if this is the place that God has brought you to bring you to Jesus Christ, you're better off here than living in a palace anywhere in the world. Uh, we see, you know what? Do you know what the truth is? We see more people trust Christ in the jails than we do on the streets. Do you know why? Because they're beggars and they'll be honest. They're not distracted by their wealth. They don't have, they've already been humbled. It's a shame that I, I, I preached in there a couple weeks ago and a kid that grew up in school and we, we've kicked God out of our schools. Now if you want to hear about God with liberty, you got to go to prison. By the way, they beg for church in the jails. They cry about it every time we go. We don't get church enough. I've had that said every week for the last two weeks. We don't get enough church here. By the way, you'd be surprised the jail commanders and the jail guards, how many times they've said to me, thank you for coming. We're so glad for what you do, whether they want it or not. You know what we need? We need more beggars. I don't mean, I don't mean you've got to go to poverty. I mean rich in faith. Outwardly, Lazarus was unclean and full of sores and clothed in rags, but inwardly he had been washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the blood of the Lamb. And the rich man didn't have time for Moses and the prophets, and Lazarus had nothing but time for anything else. And if there's one thing that keeps people from trusting Christ, it's our pride. Yes, sir. I believe pride and poverty have something to do with it. Lazarus was humbled in a very public way, so it was very little for him to humble himself under the almighty hand of God that he might be exalted in due time. And the rich man was a proud man. By the way, every person's a proud person. I've met some proud beggars too, I'll tell you that. But all he had received, he had gained by his own wisdom, his own power, his own strength. And this is what the rich man said, what will people think of me? I've gone to church all my life. It would be a shock. I think they'd rejoice because we've seen people who have been in church all their life come and say, I was never saved. And I've been under conviction. And, I, 
and, and, and gotten honest. It's always been a time of rejoicing. I think they'd think great. I think that we'd like to see somebody we love in heaven. I don't think we want to see anybody in hell. Why don't you quit thinking about what everybody else is thinking and why don't you think about what God's thinking and what he's speaking to your heart. I'm going to tell you this. I was 22 years old and a senior in Bible college and I, thought I had the same thoughts. How could, what, what are people going to think about me, the preacher's son? And I'll tell you what I thought. I thought I wouldn't burn in hell for one second for what all the world thought. The rich man died and was buried. Lazarus was carried by the angels into paradise. Everybody in this room, we share something in common with these two men. We're all going to die today, one day, if Jesus tarries. And we are not going to be condemned because of our wealth, and we will not be pitied because of our poverty. Kings and beggars will sit side by side in the kingdom of heaven. And kings and beggars will cry out side by side from the pits of hell for all eternity. It has nothing to do with the monies and the morals we have. It has everything to do with what we do with God's Son. Six brothers, one lost in hell, the other five on the way. I wonder how many people here in this room, you listen to me, we, don't like, to, we, we like this story third party, but I wonder who you and I know. I wonder who is in my life that I love that died and went to hell and they're praying for more for my lost family than I am? Is there some, fun, some family member that has already stepped out into eternity and, and we sit here secure in our salvation and we have lost our tears for those we love and it's sad that prayers are being offered by people in hell that will not be heard and not be answered. And you and I that have the truth, God hears our prayers. I just want to remind you, say, why preach this gospel message to God's people? Where are your tears? I don't want to be crying at the judgment seat that I never shared the gospel with my family, that I never wept over my family, and my friends, and those that I love. And it's a shame that there are more tears shed in hell that cannot be heard when there should be tears on earth. Heavenly Father, we pray that today that you have touched our hearts. Father, if there's one that's lost, Lord, that today they would come, that they would be honest before you, that they would confess their sin and ask Jesus Christ to come into their heart to forgive them, and Lord, to receive the gift of eternal life. And Father, for those of us that remain, Father, we pray that we be reminded of our prayers and our tears. Lord, that we not be outdone by desperate and hopeless cries of those we miss from the abyss. Lord, and we fail to have compassion on those we are here to bring to Christ ourselves. Bless now the invitation we pray in Jesus' name. Let's stand. The piano's playing. The altar's open. You're here this morning. You're not saved. There's somebody here that can take a Bible, can show you how you can know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Heaven is your home today. Some of you could come, and you don't need anybody to do that. There might be somebody here, you've heard it all your life. You just, it's never been real. You've never been honest. You need to quit playing games with your soul, with your God, with your life, and just come and fall on your face and ask Jesus Christ to save you. Confess Him. Confess Him publicly. Not be ashamed. Let the world rejoice in church. Who's praying for somebody that you're not praying for? Who's praying for some loved one in hell? Are there people that you know and that you love that are in hell? I'm, I'm sure that's true of each and every one of us. There's somebody that we love that's died in our family. There's not a family here that hasn't had somebody that's not lost, that's died. Perhaps they're praying more fervently than you and I are. We need to be praying every day for our loved ones. We need to see all men in the light of Calvary, the fires of hell, with the compassion of the cross.